Praise God. I join our dear brother, Brother Femi Adebile, and the entire members of Prem Film Productions International to thank God on this occasion of the 15th anniversary of the ministry. It is my prayer that God who has brought you this far will continue to uphold you and help you to do more in his vineyard in the name of Jesus Christ. I have been saddled with the responsibility of bringing God's word to God's people on this occasion. It is my prayer that God himself will open his mind to us uh, through this short period of sharing. I'll be speaking on the topic, how to keep the fire burning. Leviticus chapter 6 verse 13 says, The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. The fire will ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Now, towards the end of uh, the ministry of uh, Paul the Apostle here on earth, he made a bold declaration as recorded in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. This should be the pursuit of of every child of God. Now, we're talking about the good fight, we mean uh, the fight of faith. So we are not called to be quarrelsome, we are not called to be troublesome, we are not called to be meddlesome. If we must fight, and indeed we should, the fight we are expected to fight is the good fight. And then he said, I have finished my course. In other words, there is a course laid out for you and for me. It is our duty to know the course and to finish it. And he went on to say, I have kept the faith. It is not enough to hold on to faith. We must keep the faith to the very end. Now, we want to look at just two or three ways to keep the fire burning. Number one, don't stop firing. Don't stop firing. There is an account in 2 Kings chapter 13 from verse 14 to verse 19. This account of Elisha and uh, Joash, the king of Israel. Now, Elisha was in the twilight of his days here on earth. He was on a sick bed. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in verse 14 of that 2 Kings 13. Now, Elisha was fallen sick of a sickness whereof he died. In other words, it was the sickness that eventually killed him. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now, take note. The king used exactly the same words which Elisha used when he was following his master, Elijah. You know the end of the story. He received a double portion of the spirit of Elijah on that account. Now, I wouldn't know who told the king this secret that the way to receive from the prophet would be to make this declaration. But he declared, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. In essence, Joash was asking, What will I do now that you are dying? Just like Elisha knew that his master was going, and I need something from you. He cried out, My father, my father the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now, Joash the king equally cried out. So he needed something from the prophet Elijah. Verse 15, And Elijah said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. These were prophetic symbols. The bow and the arrow were instruments of war. They were instruments of fighting battles. So they were quite symbolic. We'll be looking at what they stood for in a short while. Verse 16, And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And look at this. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. So in other words, the hands of the king were on the bow and the arrow. The prophet now put his own hands on the king's hands. This is to let us know that God's hands are the hands behind every success we receive in life every success. So if the king went on to make 
a good success of every approach in his life, it was only very, very wise of him to always remember that there was a hand behind his hand. So the prophet put his hands behind his hands. And in verse 17, And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of the deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Afek till thou have consumed them. Listen, the instruction was for him to open the window eastward and fire. The prophet went on to say, after uh, the king had fired, that this is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, deliverance, the arrow of deliverance from Syria, that he was going to smite the Syrians in Afek. Afek was a part of Israel which had been captured by the Syrians. So now the Syrians were living in Afek. So as the arrow was shot in the direction of Afek, it was symbolic that the Syrians living in the possession of the children of Israel were going to be smitten. And the Bible went on to tell us that till you have consumed them, meaning the victory was not going to be partial. It was going to be total. So having done that, the prophet now went a step further. You know, three steps now. The first step, Take your bow and your arrow. Number two steps, put your hand on the bow and the arrow, which the prophet put his own hands upon. Number three, open the window and shoot eastwards. The king did exactly what the man of God asked him to do. And coming to verse 18, and they said, take the arrows, take note. And they said, take the arrows, not take the arrow. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, smite the ground, and the smote thrice, and stayed. Take the arrows, meaning there were more than enough arrows. <laughs> not just one, not just two. Take the arrows. There were more than enough arrows. And he told him to smite the ground with the arrows. The king went on to smite one, he smote two, he smote three, and he stopped. And I wouldn't know what happened. Maybe he was tired of smiting or he was satisfied with smiting only three times, or he did not understand the prophetic dimension of the action. He did not ask the prophet how many times he was to smite. The prophet said, take the arrows. He took them. He went on to say to him, smite upon the ground, and they smote thrice and stopped. That was where the mistake was. And you find that in verse 19. The Bible says, and the man of God was wroth with him. He was annoyed with him. He was angered and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then thou would have smitten Syria till thou would have consumed them. Whereas now you have you will smite Syria, but thrice, just thrice. Meaning, if there were to be many more battles against the Syrians, the Israelites were going to smite them only thrice. What caused this? The king did not understand the prophetic dimension. The man of God was struck because the king stopped too soon. This is a challenge to us, beloved man of God. As we serve God, do not give up. This is a challenge to us, beloved woman of God. As we serve God, do not give in. This is a challenge to us, beloved ministers of the gospel, and indeed all Christians. As you serve the Lord, do not back out. The king, King Joash, smote the ground three times and he stopped. I wouldn't know what you were doing for God either too, which you have stopped doing. And the fact of the matter is that God is not happy. I wouldn't know what you were doing in church as a servant of the Most High God and you are now backing out. You are losing courage. You are no longer interested. You are losing passion. You are losing the zeal. You need to be encouraged. You need to be pulled. You need to be pushed. You need to be lowered. Oh, you need to be talked to, to do the th same things you used to do with all passion. God is not happy. That's just the truth. The Bible says, and the man of God was wrought with him. This is a warning to us, beloved, that we should watch out so that we don't miss it in the place of service. Make sure you don't stop too soon. What is that thing you are doing for God? And the devil is telling you it doesn't amount to anything. And the devil is trying to tell you to stop, that you are just wasting your time. Tell him, no, 
I know God is reckoning with what I'm doing. And you go on. Push on. Go ahead. What is that thing you are doing for God and the devil is telling you, what are you making out of it? Beloved, we are not in ministry to make it. We are in ministry to make God happy. That's just it. Making it is only a bonus. <laughs> as you make God happy, God will be obliged to help you and make you happy as well. Remember the Bible says there is great joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. If your ministry keeps giving joy to heaven, you can be sure that God will make you happy here on earth too. So beloved, don't allow the devil to, dis I mean, to discourage you, to tell you what are you doing. Look at people, they have gone far ahead. The fact of the matter is this, beloved, the syllabus for your ministry is in God's hands, not in anybody's hands. Jam cannot use the syllabus of WAEC to mark your examination. They use their own syllabus. <laughs> they cannot use the syllabus for A-level to mark your exams in O-level. O-level syllabus will be used to mark your exams. So each person has his own syllabus in life. Stay there and abide by it. And each person sits in his own examination hall to write his own examination to be marked by God the Father. So you need not look left or right and see what others are doing. Face what God has called you to do. And the man of God was wrought. He was annoyed. He said, whereas now thou shalt smite thrice. I mean, Syria, but thrice. Of course, the king should have continued smiting on the prophet, until the prophet said enough. If I was the king, at least by benefit of hindsight, I might have made the same mistake as the king if I was in his shoes that day. But by understanding now, I will continue to smite the ground. I will continue until the prophet says enough. And when he says enough and it's not loud enough, I will keep smiting until he comes to touch me enough. This is the way we should run ministry. Keep running the race. Don't back out. The distance you have covered is not as much as the distance ahead of you, even if you have only one more year to spend on planet Earth. Because the, the, my native Yoruba language tells me, meaning that the race does not belong to the one who started. It belongs to the finisher. And it's the way you finish that matters truly in the end. I've seen matches that were played where teams were losing 4-0. At least I remember one. They called it the Daman Miracle. The under-20 World Cup that was played in Saudi Arabia, we were losing against Russia, if I'm not mistaken. 4-0 in the first half. Second half, we're still trailing. 4-0. And within a few minutes, we went on to draw. 4-1, 4-2, 4-3, 4-4. Nigeria against that opposition. And in the end, after extra time, Nigeria won. So that tells you the race does not belong to the starter. It belongs to the finisher. So, beloved, this is my admonition here. Keep smiting the ground. Faint, yet pursue it. That's what we see in the book of Judges. They were tired, but they were still running. Faint, yet pursue it. So don't give up. Don't give in. Don't back up. And don't back out. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. I've heard people talk about uh, having an option B, a plan B. In ministry, there is only one plan. They keep telling you, don't put all your basket, I mean, all your eggs in one basket. In ministry, you put all your eggs in one basket. And what's a basket? That's a basket of service in God's vineyard. You put everything there. You pour your life out, just like the woman with the alabaster box. What did she do? She poured out the oil, and it's a, a memoriam unto her, even till eternity. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. This brings us to point number two. Have space for more. In 2 Kings chapter 4, from verse 1 to verse 6, we see the story of a widow. Her late husband, believed to be Obadiah, was a disciple of a prophet. Her husband died a debtor, and the creditor was ready to take her two sons into servitude. This woman cried unto the prophet Elisha. Elisha asked her a question, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? This was a simple question, and the woman did not waste time. She answered. She said, Thine art unmade, art not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. The RSV says, that is the Revised Standard Version says, Your maid servant asked nothing in the house except a jar of oil. The Message Bible says, Nothing, she said. Well, I do have a little oil. This is the mentality a lot of people have. They believe they have nothing. When in the, indeed they are loaded with everything. 
They believe they have nothing when indeed they are loaded with everything. The Bible tells us that God blessed them. And he said unto them, Be ye fruitful, multiply, replenish the heart, subdue it, and have dominion. Meaning from creation, we are all loaded. We are sent into the world, packaged for purpose. So no man is empty. So this woman said she had nothing. Nothing, she said. Well, I do have a little oil. So the little oil was so insignificant to her that to her it was nothing. Elijah went on to instruct her, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few, borrow as many as you could, not a few. So the matter arising here is this. The woman's husband died the debtor. The creditor was going to take her two sons into servitude. So of course you know that what that woman needed at that point in time was money. But here, the prophet said, get vessels. <laughs> the woman urgently needed money to settle her debts. So instead of giving her money, Elisha instructed her to get vessels. Why? The answer is this. Her problem was not lack of money, but lack of vessels. And this has been the case even from history. Who, shall I say, who will go for me? That was the outcry of God. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So the problem is not really lack of money, it is lack of vessels. Some people have pulled out of ministry now, laying the blame at the doorstep of lack. They keep saying, no money, we have a lot of vision, no provision. No, no, your problem is not lack of money, it is lack of vessels. When there are vessels, God knows how to do his own things. The oil in the jar of that woman was in a state of littleness because there were no vessels. She was in a state of nothingness because there were no vessels. The woman was in a state of bitterness, seeing that her children were going to be taken away because there were no vessels. She was in a state of backwardness because there were no vessels. She was going to lose her two sons because there were no vessels. She was going to become an object of reproach because there were no vessels. In short, our problem was not lack of money, it was lack of vessels. If you are available, God is always willing to fill you up and to get you filled up. There is no time to explain the two, to fill you up and to get you filled up. If all, all that God needs are vessels, ready vessels, willing vessels. In verse 4, Elisha for thy instructed, and when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon you and upon your sons. And you pour out into all the vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. Shut the door. Why? This was to keep them focused on the divine assignment. Beloved, in ministry, in life, if you want to run your race and run successfully, there are some people against whom the door of your life must be shut out. There are people who have no bearing in your journey of destiny. <laughs> you must know how to know them and shut the door against them. Is Brother Mike telling us to hold malice against people? Is Brother Mike telling us to be arrogant and segregate against people? No, not everybody could be the friend of Jesus. That was why he chose 12 disciples. He had 70 after that. He had 120 and he had the crowd. Not everybody could be in the inner caucus. So, were the other people who were not part of the 12 disciples his enemies? Of course not. But there were people that could actually run the race with him to help him make a headway in what God sent him to do as by redeeming mankind from, uh, from sins. So, beloved, there are things, there are situations, there are environments, there are relationships against whom you must shut the door of your life and ministry if truly you want to make a success of what God has put in your hands. Shut the door. Why? To keep them focused on the divine assignment. To keep the creditor, creditor out until the miracle had been performed. You know, the creditor may come too early. He may come too soon. And if he came too soon, what would have happened? The creditor would distract them. Madam, I've been waiting. Where is my money? I'm taking your son away. But of course, the doors were shut. Even if the creditor came, he had to stay outside. Because God was working on the woman and working on her circumstance and working on her situation. So the door must be shut. There are times you come on a retreat, just you and your God alone. Cry unto God, Lord, what would you have me to do? What's your plan for my life? 
And then why did they shut the door? To prove that the miracle is solely from heaven and not from abroad. Solely from above, not from abroad. If the door had been opened, people who heard about it thereafter would say it's a lie. We saw people who brought oil into the house. So don't come and uh, brainwash us here. Don't come and tell us a lie that God did it. But then the door was shut. So there was no human interference. It came from above, not from abroad. So you might be asking, Brother Mike, meaning we cannot receive help from abroad? Of course you can. But of course, if help comes from abroad, it is by the help and by the leading of the power from above. No man will just rise and say, he wants to bless you. God must have ministered to the person. So ultimately, it is from above because promotion does not come from any other place other than from above. Why did they shut the door? To prevent neighbors from coming to ask, how far now? Before due time. Because those who had heard about what was coming to the woman, the shame that was coming to her, maybe sincerely or otherwise, some would have come. And now what is happening now? Like they keep asking people waiting upon the Lord. What is happening? Ten years have gone. What are you waiting for? Some are sincere. Some are not truly sincere. But this is a prophecy I'm making now in the name of Jesus. That at every point where people are asking how far, God will arise and show them how far in the name of Jesus. So the doors were shut so that neighbors would not come to be asking how far before due time. She did as instructed. So she went from him, that's verse 5, and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her. And she poured out, verse 6, Finally now, and it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. She asked for more vessels. After all the vessels she borrowed were full. But the son said, There is not a vessel more. And this shook me. And the oil stayed. The oil stayed. Amplified says, Then the oil stopped multiplying. The message Bible says, Then the oil stopped the Bible in basic English says, and the oil, and the flow of oil was stopped. And the flow of oil was stopped. And I began to ask the question, stopped by who? By the source. So the source of the oil stopped pumping oil when there were no more vessels to receive the oil. So beloved, inspirations can never dry up in heaven. As a song minister, inspirations will not dry up. As a drama minister, inspirations will not dry up. As a book writer, inspirations can never dry up in heaven. As a preacher of the word of God, inspirations can never dry up. In as much as you are a willing vessel to receive more, the source is willing to give, I mean to keep giving. Meaning the oil would not have stopped flowing if there had been more vessels. During a heavy rainfall, for instance, very heavy rainfall and long-lasting rainfall, if all the vessels to put out in the rain to get filled, if all of them get filled, you discover that does not stop the rain from flowing, from, I mean, from pouring. After all the vessels placed outside are full, the rain can continue to pour for another hour, two, or even all through the day, not minding that the vessels are already full. But beloved, God's grace is different. If there are no more vessels, there will be no more flow. That is just it. If you are no longer available for him, he doesn't waste his grace. He looks for another person to pour the grace into. If your life is no longer aligned with him, he doesn't waste his grace. He looks for another person to pour his grace into. If you are no longer positioned to receive the divine network for divine inspirations, he will not waste these inspirations. He looks for somebody that is willing and well aligned and positioned for divine network to receive the inspirations. If you receive the inspirations, but you don't do anything with them, you keep wasting time, wasting uh, uh, divine arrangement, of course, the inspirations will no longer flow. I pray this will not be our portion in the name of Jesus. So there must be a space for more. You let God know that, Father, I am willing, I am available. Pour more into me. Use me to reach out to your world. And God is ever willing. And finally, number three, you must keep looking forward. You must keep looking forward. Remember what we are looking at is how to keep the fire burning. You must keep looking forward. I'll read the scripture here. The Bible says in Luke 9, 62, And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. No man, having put his hand to the plow. Take note, 
the, the Bible did not say, no man who refuses to put his hand on the plow. The hand is on the plow. But the man chooses to look back. The Bible says that kind of man is not fit for the kingdom of God. So that's the ultimate. If your hand is on the plow and you keep looking back, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. So that means, you know, the kingdom of God is the umbrella. When we look at this, we think he's talking about heaven alone. No, even the kingdom of heaven here on earth, the kingdom of God here on earth, God's vineyard. As a servant of God in the vineyard, you are working in God's kingdom. So the Bible is saying if your hand is on the plow and you keep looking back, and what is it you look back at? We can take uh, a cue from the life of uh, jo um, Lot's, Lot's wife. The Bible says she looked back and she became a pillar of salt. The Bible goes on to tell us, remember Lot's wife. Meaning Lot's wife had become a memorial to remind people of the danger of looking back. So God is not willing that you become another reminder to people of the danger of looking back, even on the highway as you move in the kingdom of God. No, it's not the will of God for you. God's will is for us to keep pressing, to keep moving, to keep forging ahead, never to look back. Whatever it is that the devil has positioned to make you look back and lose your place in the kingdom of God, I pray such things are destroyed in the name of Jesus. The grace for us to keep marching forward until we are able to end like Apostle Paul. And we are able to declare like Apostle Paul. As he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7, that I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I pray the grace to be able to end and end well. The Lord will give unto us in the name of Jesus. This is my prayer for you. This is my prayer for me. And I pray the Lord will put a stamp of authority upon this prayer, we will not miss it. We will not back out. We will not give in. We will not give up in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening. The Lord bless you. Amen.